Hi, uh, a very warm good morning to everybody who's logged in. I like to thank each one of you for joining us for this very important opening plenary, which is uh, aiding recovery, building resilience, policy, regulatory, and industry responses. Um, we have had a very overwhelming response to the summit already. We have over seventeen hundred registrations, and we are very grateful for everybody who's taken the time and logged in. Uh, so to start off uh, today's discussions, we have with us a very special guest, uh, Mr. V. Vedinathan. While he needs no introduction, he is the MD and CEO of IDFC First Bank. Uh, he formed Capital First, which was then uh, finally merged into ICICI Bank. And I don't want to take too much time introducing him. I would request uh, Mr. Vedinathan to please join in and give us the opening address on towards an inclusive ecosystem, the last mile. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is really a, a, a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here with all of you uh, uh, at the inaugural session of uh, Inclusive Finance Summit by Access Assist. So thank you very much for uh, being here and for inviting me. Uh, I actually put together a quick presentation for you and I'm just going to flash it for you. Then we'll start uh, conveying. Just, just help me with the share screen. Share screen. And this one. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is my subject for the morning. Uh, the key subject that at least I thought was relevant here is that how do we create an inclusive ecosystem uh, that will then come back to help inclusive financing across maybe all categories of financial services needs of customers. And then, uh, you know, uh, we, we take a few challenges. I feel that India has covered a lot of ground, but there are challenges. We'll talk about that. Now, uh, to, to kick this off, let me just share with you uh, a, a, a quick story about a visit that we made to a village. Uh, and this village was largely about the uh, milk economy. And uh, there were about, this is a village of about 600 people, about 100 families. And you can see, uh, you know, how warm these people are uh, when we go there and we meet them. And uh, they had put up the Shamiana and, and they explained to us the entire ecosystem, how the economics of the milk economy works. I'll share more about that later to you. Uh, you could see that, you know, the village gathered here, maybe about 50 or 60 people in the audience. And uh, you can see that uh, this uh, small child actually went to their home. And uh, I think that gentleman there is probably his father. And uh, I asked this kid some, you know, very interesting questions about, just some questions about, you know, asked him, tell me tables of five or six. And I asked him, uh, you know, you know, some quick numbers about what is eight plus 15 or something. And the guy was very quick and like he, he spoke super fast. And he shocked me, surprised me with, with his speed. And, you know, he wasn't, of course, in vernacular, which is great. Then uh, you could see the ecosystem here. This is a discussion on the economy. I'll talk, I'll show you a video later. So I'm not going to spend time on this slide. Uh, and then uh, when I asked them, how is this village operating? They said in the last five years, they're seeing serious amount of roads getting built. Maybe in the urban area, we've not seen so many roads here or there, whatever. But I can tell you, rural economy, road connections are getting fantastic. Uh, I asked them about the villages, the, you know, about school. They said there are three villages, all of us at Ninga Common School. The amazing thing was they said the government schools are better than private schools. At least, at least the three guys who spoke said that. And they said the quality of midday meals was good. They said a bicycle in higher grade, roads are better, toilets. They were very proud about the toilets, actually. And I tell you, the Swachh Bharat is truly working in my mind from what I saw. Uh, we even talked about rotating crops to maximize profits. I mean, normally they make about 10, 12,000 rupees per family, but this guy was making 50,000 a month. Uh, then uh, they said, look, in a village, actually, whatever 10, 12,000 they make a month is, is okay because their expenses are not that much and they could manage. Uh, this guy had taken a housing loan of uh, and paying an EMR 5,000 a month. Uh, this guy made an interesting comment. You'll hear that in the video. He said, Paisa is a Paisa Bantar. And that is a very key point. I was so tempted to this comment that I always wanted to make this a subject of my speech. Uh, but uh, uh, but maybe you can get the spirit of what I'm saying. He said, Paisa is a Paisa Bantar. And it was a very telling comment. Uh, Paisa is a Paisa Bantar. And uh, then... Uh, I asked these people, how many have taken a loan from bank? I was really proud. You know, you can see the hands going up. They said, so many had taken a loan from our bank. And I will tell you how we go over this process later. How many have taken a loan from a bank? You see it here. Uh, you know, of course, I shook the hands for taking it uh, from us. Uh, then insights from locals, they were wonderful, as you can see in the video. And you can see that here. Uh, you know, they were just uh, giving us a nice meal and they were just uh, really wonderful. Now, uh, 
I want to just show to you that we went to saw the biogas. Uh, you know, they're not even wasting uh, dung. They're actually taking all the dung, putting it and making a biogas. We have financed the biogas. So thank you, Note. And I'm going to show you a small clipping now and then we'll take it from there. This is sharing. Sorry, you said something? Uh, I want to just uh, pause there and, uh, you know, if I request you to just reflect on the conversation, you see, most people in rural locations, people who are taking borrowing small loans of 50,000 rupees, or in this example, he was borrowed 1.5 lakhs from us. They are honest people. They really mean to pay you. They are semi-literate. You can make out, they can have smattering of English, but really only 12% of India speaks English. They use mobile phone, but usually a bit of feature phones. Very enterprising people. I mean, I can't tell you, I spent about three, four hours with them and had even a meal with them and they were like wonderful. So I can't tell you the amount of, I, I can't describe it for you. And when you see them and talk to them, the needs are like us as well of people in urban India, like us, literally. For example, we have needs for say, payments. We need to spend. They have need for payments. We have need for uh, savings. We need to park our money somewhere. They have need for savings. 
but it is harder for them because branch is not not close and there is bc and bcs are not exactly uh, bcs are good good job but end of the day they are charging money for depositing money in the bc account 5 rupees 10 rupees and all that is also is effective material for them we have need for investments they have need for more investment need for investment because end of the day they need to park the money somewhere and get a better return the poor people anyway we have at least mutual funds aif and all that kind of stuff they don't we have need for insurance they have more need for insurance because their safety net is not there at least we have a safety net in our lives uh, 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 we have need for borrowings they have need for borrowings more than us in fact they are getting at 20% 22% we are getting at 7% 8% for home loans and maybe 6.5 now so the point is that across the board the needs are similar just that everything is expensive for them and this is not the only thing you know air conditioners uh, sorry uh, any anything whether it's sachi or electricity or uh, interest rates everything is expensive for that ecosystem so needs are there it's expensive it's like how mahatma gandhi said you know uh, poverty is the worst violence of all it is definitely true because that's the kind of uh, ecosystem they live in now but they're enterprising they're honest they're all god fearing i'm uh, i'm not saying god fearing people are better or worse that's not my commentary but the point is at least they they have the philosophy that they got to pay back and there's someone watching them and um, uh you know and and they pay extra everywhere because that's how the unit cost economics work now in this circumstance uh, now think of covid now when covid came these people are even more affected because everything around us digitized so all over the ecosystem we are finding uh, you know articles all over net saying that how covid has digitized india and all that which is all true by the way we we've seen that you you know upi numbers 100 billion per month and all that but the thing is that while that has happened the fact is that uh, 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 and and you can see doctors have become e doctor shopping has become e shopping commerce has become e commerce social commerce education has become e education this all true but one key insight i found when i speaking to my driver the other day and the guy who 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 drives me around every day i, I asked him how do your children study he said they are studying on the mobile phone now i really can't scratch my head how to study on a mobile phone because you know the screen it is so small we can't see for more than half an hour one hour we say we want to break and all that but how can a child see on a mobile phone and i want to show you this uh, small clip out here and i want to you know uh, drive home a point after that so now you move ahead from this slide from this uh, from the story and then i want to see how this child is studying on uh, on a mobile phone this is a Boy, probably scratching his head, not feeling good for him, uh, and, and you know, peering so close into the mobile phone is very hard. Look at these two children studying in the same room, and you know, they stuck the mobile phone. By the way, this not India has three hundred three hundred million feature phones. You don't even have this facility on that, and and think how you can see a Teams call with you know twenty icons there. It's hard, very hard. And then uh, you know, this child has a laptop, and she should thank herself. Probably she's thanking. i don't know if she is she's not uh, but you see at least this person has a laptop but if you see if 400 500 million in india children are studying like this if at all it's very hard now the last mile connectivity the instrument india has digitized this is the point i've written it up for here education have picked up education moved online yes but poor don't have laptops true so can you do a teams call on feature phone no Now, assume you have a feature phone. Can you really see a team's called ten parts of the mobile screen? No. How effective is e-education to them? Then the gap in learning only increases. Now, obviously, this child after three or four, this child after two or three years is never going to catch up with this child. And then uh, the the impact in earning is lifelong. So this is an issue of the last mile problem, and that is why I named my presentation the last mile. And this phenomenon is carrying over industry after industry that are all moving online. now therefore i'd like to uh, you know just uh, within the next 5 minutes if i have time i'm just going to close this with three subjects i want to talk about the last mile problem the vernacular problem the cash economy and the spin off benefits of a digital economy in inclusive financing so i want to stop my presentation here but i want to just talk you through it now if you think of uh, the, uh, the the you know this discussion with these villagers and all the stuff and by the way these are like close to about uh, uh, let me say i must have had these kind of conversations and my teams have with maybe about uh, 30 or 40 such uh, industries and talked to many people uh, they are still dealing in cash 
I don't know what the inclusive finance summit is going to talk today. And of course, digitization has happened. You pay all that, but I can tell you a large part of the ecosystem is running in cash. Okay, and I'll tell you one more thing. Uh, look at micro finance industry. Micro finance industry has something like about sixty million unique customers and probably about hundred million accounts. The Indian ecosystem has moved. to giving them credit in their bank accounts digitally which is a big leap big big leap forward of course earlier when that was in cash but every month these people or not every month maybe every week or a fortnight or, or month depending on the uh, respective <coughs> mfi company or bank these people are repaying in cash now when you repaying in cash for a 2 lakh crore or 2.5 lakh crore mfi market and considering it's about one year loans typically let me say about 20000 crores per month is coming back in cash from these people to be paid to the lenders and someone should physically go there count their total that tally that recon that you ask these people why are they still paying in cash they are saying <coughs> that their income is in cash so i asked them why is income in, if your income is in cash then why do you have to pay through your uh, uh 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 you know why don't you deposit in your account because bc charges money not all but you know the surprise so they feel <coughs> therefore when we uh, you know when imagine a time and people sit together probably just pay through upi and so paying in cash how much the whole you know this ecosystem is going to change therefore to digitize uh, uh the rural india uh, is going to be a prime 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 uh, importance as i talked earlier the last mile connective the tool or the instrument is going to be of extreme importance <coughs> because you're not going to reach the last mile and the, and, and and you know it some definite intervention has to happen because market economics will not solve this for it will solve it but i guess it will take a much longer and like you know we had uh, uh, a home and uh, everything has been an intervention for the right reasons like that got to figure out the last mile intervention then the moment that amount of cash economy of either rural or even urban poor comes down the impact let me just frame that uh, picture for you today when we see uh, you know our urban markets and even uh, <coughs> the, the let me say middle class upper middle class etc now bank accounts are now digitized now cash flow is all disclosed very well um, now now therefore some Uh, some entity is able to scrape that information digitally they are able to now analyze this information digitally you are able to give cash flow based lending that ecosystem is dramatically opened up you know then we are talking of aa account aggregator we are talking of ai ml capabilities for scraping that information we are talking of oaken we are talking of lsp i mean this this place is truly humming with activity and dramatic things are happening but when that power of that ecosystem that's the coming up in urban india when that transports itself to rural india a dramatic things uh, really uh, are um, you know are going to happen and if you think and talk to these people already you know the cow dung is being replaced by maybe lpg not maybe by lpg you know the candles in the outs or the homes are now getting replaced by electricity electricity has reached a lot of places the hand fans are being replaced by fans in some places even coolers names are being changed not not changed but names are being like they're not name name now biometric is a real good identity um informal village reputation is already becoming um let me say you know the bureaus are a better indicator than than probably you know systemic in indicator for replacing the uh, reputation of the person in the village so lots of dramatic things are happening out there and uh, the uh, and and that augurs well but if you combine all these dramatic things along with you know taking out this cash economy and replacing it and being able to analyze the data etc so the entire fintech ecosystem everything will move can can move rural and that game can uh, you know uh, uh, dramatically change then from there after that sort of uh, you know uh, uh, digitalization and cash economy being replaced with the digital economy in rural mind you i believe it's very very powerful with that then the uh, uh, you know the uh, imagine then they can start investing in the stock markets even imagine if poor people start investing 100 rupees as a sip per month into a stock market you know what kind of investment opportunities opens up for them and for the for what it means for india uh, imagine if uh, they start getting uh, insurance in a little more uh, uh, you know they, they, much better issue now government is frankly giving them very good insurance through that uh, 
I think Pradhan Mantra uh, Jeevan Bhima scheme, but you know, it can become even more market economics. So this whole thing of being able to uh, get the last mile problem solved, to get the digitization of the economy going in a very big way in the rural India that has dramatic impacts on what it can do. Uh, and third vernacular, you know, we are talking in this program, we're probably 12% of India and maybe 88% of India wouldn't understand the word of what we spoke today. So, uh, you know, the, the power of vernacular, I believe that if you put the three pieces together, uh, there is uh, there is a mega things coming and frankly, new markets can open up uh, from there uh, because, uh, uh, because think about it, today we do MFI. MFI was a big, you know, uh, uh, first principles thinking from traditional lending. But why MFI only for women? You can open a new market. If you did MFI group borrowing for men, uh, well, it, or men and women, mixed genders. Frankly, that could be another 2.5 lakh, another 3 lakh crore market, 5 lakh crore market opening up there and can seep into the grassroots. So, uh, we, we, then the, you know, a newer forms of ecosystem can open up uh, to, to sum it up, uh, you know, whether it is borrowing, savings, investments, uh, insurance, whatever. Uh, in all of these uh, segments, you know, basically with the uh, these three factors, of the last mile um, and the other two things I talked about, uh, you know, the the the, the uh, digitization and the vernacular. These three put together can just really open up really big things. I mean, we we've been uh, traveling to many of these places. We just feel that uh, it's like insanely uh, the the opportunity is fantastic from business point of view, and the social need is uh, crying. And uh, we need to you know any amount of intervention we do to address uh, these two or three things will really help. So that's my uh, quick take for uh, you know comments I want to leave with you. Um, there are opportunities, there are challenges. I just hope all of us work with post haste and do as many interventions as possible to crack the system open. Uh, it's good for India, good for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all I want to share with all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for highlighting these very important uh, points uh, while we kickstart uh, deliberations for the Intrusive Finance India. I think uh, this has set context and tone for uh, the discussions that come forward. With that, I'm very happy to introduce a well-represented panel, uh, which will be moderated by Ms. Jennifer, who is uh, CEO Catalyze Global Impact LLC. Welcome, Jennifer and the panelists. Uh, the panelists for today's session are Mr. R.B. Santosh, Head Government Engagement, South Asia Mastercard, and Mr. Shaji KV, DMD Nabad. Uh, Mr. Ajit Pai, unfortunately, will not be able to join us for today's session. Uh, so with that, uh, Jennifer, we uh, hand over the charge to you, and we look forward to a very insightful discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Priyambada. Um, and thank you, Mr. Vadyanathan. I think you've given very insightful opening remarks to introduce our panel. So I'm, I'm truly honored to moderate uh, this esteemed panel um, with Santosh Kumar, the head of uh, MasterCard South Asia uh, Government Engagement, and Shaji KV, the Deputy Managing Director at NABARD. I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion. Um, financial inclusion, the progress across India, urban and rural, is among the most impressive globally over the last 20 years. Tremendous progress uh, and incredible interaction and I think good synergies from the public and private sector initiatives from government, from the RBI, from multiple private sector players in the mezzo or infrastructure level of the financial sector and definitely from all of the financial services providers of which it's just blossoming and has been over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, that said, the last two years have really been quite a roller coaster um, and we've all, I think, experienced a very deep impact around the world and certainly in India of the impact of the lockdowns um, that have triggered trade shocks, travel restrictions, um, migration that was unplanned, uh, job losses, uh, job reductions um, for those lucky enough to maintain their jobs um, in the formal or informal sectors, uh, inflation in some areas, in some sectors, and overall economic dislocation. Um, we're really living in historic times uh, and, and surviving together, I think, as a, as a, as a globe through this pandemic. Um, 
The government has definitely responded with key uh, mitigation initiatives, including tremendous fiscal stimulus of over 20 trillion rupees. And the RBI has enacted expansionary monetary policy and remained absolutely vigilant in their financial supervision and, and ongoing um, really uh, uh, shepherding of the financial sector. Um, and yet uh, financial institutions have, have really been hanging on doing their very best with reduced staff under these uh, travel and mobility restrictions and gathering restrictions um, and really doing their very best uh, to serve their clients over these last two years. Um, and they haven't always been able to fully access the available funds, government funds and other funds uh, from emergency windows that were opened so that they could um, online and really meet the surging demand uh, for emergency funds. Um, our panel is going to discuss these public and private sector activities, uh, responses, and what's needed looking ahead to really help rebuild, help India recover um, for both households and businesses in urban and rural areas. Um, and what really is the role of an inclusive financial sector in this recovery that we all are hoping will emerge, that we can build together in 2022. So um, as I turn to our two panelists, um, I'd like to ask both of you uh, the same question. I have two questions for you, but we'll take the first here. So, Given this backdrop of what we've been living the last two years, um, when do you see economic recovery being realized? And what should be the priorities for the public sector to promote a timely recovery? And let me first turn to uh, Santosh and then uh, we'll open up the floor to Shaji. And then for the next question, we'll flip it around. Over sure. to you, Santosh. Thanks, uh, Dr. Jennifer. So, uh if you say, uh, when do we see the uh, economy recovering? I think I'm 100% optimistic that the economy has started recovering already in India. And it's thanks to the uh, vaccination drive that has built a lot of confidence in people. Uh, the kind of medical support people have been getting against the fight against COVID. And people are, you can see now people are traveling. They are traveling for festivals. They are traveling, meeting family members. They are traveling for work. Airports are full. People have started going back to office. Uh, there's a lot of improvement in the consumer and industry sentiments. So I think uh, if you ask me, we are back. I mean, uh, it's on the recovery path and things look very positive. All of us, wherever we travel, we can see a lot of people. Uh, there's that optimism. And I think the vaccination drive and the measures the government has taken to uh, control COVID uh, uh, has really, really helped. Uh, so coming to your other part of the question, what uh, public sector support is required, uh, what, will, what things more can be done? Uh, Government of India has already introduced a lot of initiatives uh, to help the affected communities, uh, you know, the marginalized people, uh, uh, the poor people. And uh, this really is helping uh, uh, recognizing the potential for economic growth and poverty elevation. And it's really helping uh, drive inclusion uh, in the society. And there are a lot of measures the government has taken, which I would want to list uh, here, uh, which are good steps. Uh, one is... Uh, supporting the poor people with uh, no field accounts, bank accounts, you know, where they can maintain minimum balance, minimum deposit. This is really helping them get into the uh, banking sector. They're, they're getting into the ecosystem because of that. Uh, they have simplified the KYC requirement for opening a bank account. Aadhaar card, which today most citizens in India have, even in the rural area, most of them have Aadhaar card. That is being used as a KYC document for for your uh, this proof and for your uh, other details, you know, uh, date of birth and other stuff. Uh, government is working on a PIDF scheme, uh, which is the Payment Infrastructure Development Fund. Uh, it's an initiative uh, RBI is working together with banks and uh, the car networks. This will provide a lot of impetus uh, for developing the uh, payment ecosystem and acceptance in uh, tier three, tier four, tier five. Uh, cities in north in uh, northeastern areas of the country, which is which today do not have a uh, very uh, 
uh, improved uh, acceptance ecosystem uh, to what mr vedyanathan said in the beginning inclusion is very very important and you know how do we get to the last mile so that's that's something that we are looking at uh, even uh, the regulator is planning to have a upi facility on feature phone so this will really help people in the rural area who have feature phone to process uh, payments you know and other other kind of transactions can happen on the feature phone so these are some steps they are doing other areas that i think would be important would be to accelerate uh, the de uh, uh, democratization of technology uh, and there should be significant opportunity to design and develop technology solutions in india but it should not be just for local use but it should also be for export to other nations with similar needs that's one second sophisticated data analytics and artificial intelligence tools to become widely available for people across india that's something that will be required going forward uh, then access to global supply chains so we should have a right mix of policy and infrastructure to enable small business to produce and to scale competitive and high quality and bring more predictability and uh, stability with processes the other things should be uh, predictable and stable regulatory system should be there in the country uh, the approval process should be easier there should be easier regulatory process single window concept which will help uh, these people uh, get into the ecosystem smoothly and uh, do a lot of good work uh, the other thing is enable digital trade uh, so given the pandemic is a related slowdown of the flow of goods and people digital trade has been a lifeline to keep the economy moving so what is it that we can do to encourage digital trade uh, digital transactions uh, enable indian companies indian startups uh, uh, to offer solutions not only in india but also worldwide uh, internationally also to have a right uh, tax reform data flow regime global interoperable standards and policies and accompanying regulatory frameworks these are my takes on uh, take on this uh, jennifer terrific santosh thank you i think you really started off this this issue very well and i completely agree we've seen tremendous response from the government um and still uh, future priorities i like your phrase democratizing digital financial services um i think that's that really sums it up well for households and small businesses so shaji turning it over to you what's your take on this question yeah so i i also generally concur with what mr santosh has told uh, we are already uh, on the path of recovery yes the data shows that no we are uh, at growing at around 8.4% vis a vis contra contraction of around 7.4% year ago uh, and only one point to note is that we have not still reached the pre pandemic gdp level that is one area which we are lacking but we will we are soon to reach there so the globally the trend is that no uh, it is moving towards a multipolar world with the power center is uh, of the global economy is shifting towards asia and india is expected to play a large part so for that to happen india has to grow fast and indian indian growth has to be very inclusive otherwise no there will be problems within the country uh, as you as you see the factors no uh, the consumption demand and the investment demand in the country was lagging of course it was uh, the adversities were more due to the covid influence as well so now a uh, lot of monetary initiatives have been taken but i feel that no uh, monetary initiatives have got certain limitations now the fiscal initiatives have to kick in and government is already taking a lot of uh, steps to revive consumer demand and also investment demand especially in the private sector and government is also chipping in with a lot of uh, uh, no initiatives so now the government is also taking steps to ensure that this growth is inclusive uh, for that uh, you all know the rural employment guarantee scheme has been augmented food support has been given so that people are having excess money in their hands for for, uh, for other purchases uh, and then uh, you you see the agriculture sector the recovery is visible uh, the in fact the economy recovery is led by the agriculture sector consecutively we are showing positive uh, growth in that production has improved so area so in so on has improved productivity has improved so now whatever the surpluses have been generated in agriculture has to create jobs through some uh, you know setting up of enterprises at the farm gate rather than you know shifting that to the urban centers because migration has happened and lot of people are now in the rural areas we need to provide jobs to them uh, for that to happen lot of farm gate infrastructure need to be put in uh for for that government has come out with schemes which i will be touching 
Uh, now, uh, already the, the speakers before me have told about digital empowerment and last mile financial inclusion, which government uh, has taken a lot of steps backed by the uh, healthy uh, banks and also especially the public sector banks. Uh, now, uh, government's initiative to transform India is evident in a lot of initiatives like uh, Gadi Shakti National Ma Master Plan for Infrastructure Development and also this Atmanarbhar Bharat Mission. A lot of uh, you know, schemes have been dovetailed into these uh, programs and also government has announced a national infrastructure pipeline to kick off uh, you know, this infrastructure development and also uh, to generate funds, a national monetization plan also has been done. So now uh, we have to now ensure that you know, the other sectors, the agriculture sector I have already told, uh, but then the manufacturing sector has to improve. For that to happen, steps have been already taken and the government is providing steps, uh, providing support in terms of uh, capital expenditure, then reforms in sectors like infrastructure, manufacturing and telecom. And uh, policy initiatives include uh, cutting taxes, tax reforms, uh, then production in, uh, performance incentive schemes have been there, already talked about that. Now, pro providing timely credit, especially to the agri and the SME sector is very important in this revival phase. Uh, we have an agriculture credit target of 16.5 lakh crores, uh, that uh, set to 16.5 trillion in, in rupees uh, for the current year. And then this credit has to be given at the affordable rate also. And then, then we have to now induce farmers to adopt new technology, then mechanization and commercialization. These need to be done. So the agri infra fund scheme, which uh, government of India has announced, is aimed at these things that no the the share of farm income on the produce or at the cost, the consumer price has to be improved for that to happen farmers need to uh, no do the upstream activities of processing and such other things for that this agri infra fund scheme is coming in handy and uh, uh, one more one more thing is that no uh, there is uh, the agri value chain that is all, well, one important sector which uh, nabar also is looking at so now, instead of uh, viewing agricultural activities as standalone entities, we need to integrate that into a value chain and then provide necessary infrastructure for banks, both digital infrastructure as well as uh, no, uh, as well as uh, the uh, the technology, infra the the, uh, the information infrastructure for the banks to finance. Now, uh, and, uh, we need to now, uh, along with the you know in general infrastructure rural infrastructure need to be there for that rural infrastructure development fund of nabad is now uh, augmenting its resources especially to improve the healthcare because healthcare is one thing which we need to do uh, in in the rural sector for that to happen a lot of uh, investment in health infrastructure so we have prioritized uh, at the instance of the government to target health infrastructure in rural areas so that the people are remaining healthy and uh, and and employable so that you no know, the productivity can be improved so uh, along with this you no know, we need to now have, have a have a watch on the sustainable development because now activity level is going to have increase but then we need to ensure sustainability already our prime minister has emphasized these factors uh, uh, and then the most important thing the poverty alleviation of course uh, recent indications are there, there are some, some states with more than 50% uh, you know, hunger index is also there. So the micro infrastructure approach is what we are now trying to make area specific and uh, identifying the problems in those area and in a highly decentralized, smart, clean and crime, climate resilient system uh, need to be developed. That is what we are working for. And, and uh, the agriculture sector, the water sector and the energy sector has to be uh, augmented through these efforts. So as we uh, go to the, uh, the recovery path, uh, the recovery need to be inclusive and it need to be sustainable. That is the motto which we, with which the government is working. That's what I feel. Wonderful, Shaji. That's one I, I so appreciate uh, interacting with uh, Nabard always. You have such a holistic view in terms of rural and national development, really working across so many sectors of, of the economy and households and businesses. I think you've given an incredibly comprehensive approach. Um, and that really takes the discussion forward. So I'm gonna come back to you and then I'll, I'll uh, for my second question, and then we'll turn to Santosh for his response. But so you've touched on this already in your first response, uh, but in terms of you know, focusing in exactly on financial service providers uh, who are a large part of our, our audience today, um, what would you say are the key priorities from public 
or private sectors, including the financial service providers themselves, how do we best strengthen those financial service providers to really help uh, them rebound so that they can then in turn better serve households and, and small businesses? Yeah. So here I would like to touch upon two aspects of these financial services. One is, of course, uh, the previous speakers have told about the digital transformation which is happening in the financial services that need to be taken forward. And there need to be the second aspect is that there need to be a differentiated response to the to the various problems which are now coming, because these are all new problems which are coming up. For that to happen, the differentiated response to be there. Touching about the, the, the on the digital part, uh, Already the COVID pandemic has uh, accelerated the transformation and uh, there are a lot of innovations coming in and, uh, and what, what is happening is that you know, the, the production of financial services with implications on the structure of finance itself, we, we have seen that and Mr. Vaidhanathan has already touched upon that, those aspects, how we need to, uh, to do the last mile connectivity in a differentiated manner. Uh, so there has been a you know, steep increase in access. Uh, but then there need to be some sort of uh, confidence building measure in you know, the users in terms of customer protection network. That is very important nowadays because now they have to be sure about it because they are not uh, seeing uh, you know the, the cash, the real, the real cash, but then they are transacting in a digital manner. So they need to be reassured of uh, the, the, the mishaps which are happening. Uh, so already RBA has come out with certain uh, a lot of guidelines for that, but then we need to educate the people. So, the, so that is very important. Then, the, then of course, uh, for, uh, for 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 in, improving the uh, confidence, there need to be connectivity issues to be solved because rural areas are having connectivity issues. In that count, I can tell you the reason, uh, our experience on that because we are embarking on a, a large scale uh, pro project on computerizing the cooperative structure, the last mile, the primary agriculture credit societies. So one challenge we face there is the connectivity. So we are already in talks with uh, Bharat Broadband Network Limited, who have been given the task of connecting 2.5 lakh panchayats with broadband network. Already they have achieved almost a 1.5 lakh. So another a lakh of uh, panchayats need to be connected. So that that need to be there. Otherwise, no, there will be problems in uh, in the in the confidence uh, of using the digital means. Else, what Mr. Maidharajan told that they will receive cash and they have to carry the cash to the, 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 the faraway branches or they have to incur expenses at the BC centers for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, depositing the cash. So uh, now there are certain critical gaps, which, uh, which I already told the infrastructure that uh, payment infrastructure development fund Mr. with Mr. Santosh has told that is uh, the, the, the way forward for improving the, uh, the touch points at, uh, at, the, at the nooks and corners of the country including on the hilly and the northeastern regions. Uh, the connectivity I already touched, but then that need to be ensured. Then the convenience and rele relevance of these uh, uh, products. So these procedures, the procedures with which they have to be onboarded, a lot of uh, simplifying acts have been there, but still there are uh, some difficulty in understanding the products. For that to have, for, for making it very easy, we need to have uh, the financial literacy uh, no, uh, efforts uh, we have uh, at NABAD uh, the financial inclusion fund through which a uh, lot of financial literacy camps have been conducted. Uh, then we are encouraging even the payment banks, the small finance banks who are having access to the remotest of the areas to conduct those, uh, those, those activities. So now, uh, now coming to the differentiated response, yes, the, 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 the needs are different. So we need to structure the financial products uh, along with these capabilities we are building on the digital front. So, uh, as I said earlier, the value chain approach, because now that uh, the digital transactions are more, we have clear visibility of the cash flow, which is happening through the system. So we can escrow these cash flows and make uh, those who are inaccessible to credit, because now, right now also, almost 30% of the agriculture uh, is now rely, uh, no, in, uh, is, is relying on informal credit uh, things. So they, they, we have to formalize that uh, no, credit uh, access to these 30 percent for that to happen most most of these uh, farmers are either leased land farmers or they don't have uh, the assets to show so, but then they are producing and then if if it is connected to the agri value chain and then their cash flows are being mapped escrowing or uh, you know, through proper contracts we we can give them finance through the formal financial system so that is one differentiated response we need to uh, build up as we go ahead in in, in ensuring inclusive growth that's all. Wonderful. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. I, I think you've really flagged a number of key priorities across the financial sector. So now let's turn over to Santosh. Uh, back to you for your response on the second question. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully he'll be able to join back in. All right, then, Shaji, I'm going to continue uh, with my next question for you. Um, and that is, the pandemic has triggered different impacts across the country, uh, and very much, to use the word you just utilized, uh, differentiated uh, across urban areas and uh, rural areas, and across different states, different geographies across the country. Of course, India is vast from north to south and east to west, and, and we would expect this kind of differentiated impact. Um, how do you see Nabard's priorities for the agricultural and rural sectors? And you've already given a hint of some of these in your first answer, but to promote this uh, hopeful economic recovery in 2022 and the sustainable inclusive growth that you've made reference to. So now if you see that, the, especially the agri and rural sector, the credit absorption capacity of the people have to be improved. That can happen only through meaningful infrastructure development. We realized that and since 1996, we have been working on improving the rural infrastructure and uh, government also has created a fund within NABAD to provide at cheaper uh, rates to the state governments uh, to entice them to invest in rural infrastructure. So now what we did, uh, no, in, in, as I said earlier also, that uh, we have refocused our uh, priorities in rural infrastructure. First thing, we fast-tracked those, those sanctions, which, which used to take around a month. We work closely with the government and also the public sector undertakings who are uh, implementing the projects. And then we fast-tracked the decisions which are happening. And then we refocused uh, these activities, one to health and then to education. These two sectors were given priority. Uh, of course, the, the normal activities like road, bridges and all continued, but then we focused on health and education infrastructure because we felt that you know, as we go ahead, there should be an inclusive growth and people should be healthy enough and people should be knowledgeable enough to, uh, to, to be a part of this growth. Second thing which we did was the collectivization because you know, a lot of fragmented holdings are there. Even uh, we uh, started with the self-help group uh, approach so now we went ahead uh, with the collectivization of the farmers, that to small and marginal farmers. So through the farmer producer organization. So if you see that Nabad is the front runner in that, and uh, already around 4,000 uh, know, farmer producer organizations have been uh, you know, in place now. And we have a target. The government of India has a target of uh, you know, forming 10,000 new farm, new farm producer organization, of which almost 60% target is for the Nabad to have. So by collectivization, what we intended to in is that to increase the income, the share of the, 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 the price, the price which a consumer pay, it, the share which a farmer receives have to be increased. So doubling farmer income is one thing, but for that to happen, they need to do a lot of upstream activities like uh, no, uh, this agro processing and such other things. So that leads us to the agri value chain approach, which earlier I touched upon. So what we are trying to do is that no, uh, like, the farmer producer organizations are, uh, are being made as epicenters for this agri value chain and they will be processing the surpluses because earlier we used to have uh, you know, sustenance farming. Now it is a surplus farming because productivity has increased, production has increased and a lot of marketable surpluses are there. But of course, uh, the, because of the fragmented thing, we need to aggregate those surpluses. So if a middleman comes and aggregate, then the larger share of uh, the price will be going to him. So we want these farmer producer organizations to, uh, to aggregate these produce and do the primary processing and if possible, the secondary processing also. Here are two schemes, one scheme of agri infra fund and uh, the second scheme of uh, primary agriculture cooperatives as multi-service centers. These two schemes uh, go hand in hand. And we have converged these two schemes, the agri infra fund scheme where government is giving interest subvention. And also there is a guarantee for the loans taken by these farm produce organizations. Uh, and then the, uh, the cooperatives which are at the last mile, they also do a lot of activities which a farm produce organization is uh, aimed, a aiming at. 
so we need to uh, we need to now encourage them to do in more such of those activities rather than doing the credit operations so that is where we call them as multi service centers so along with credit they should do other services like uh, go downs grading sorting processing even uh, retailing also at the at the village level so under that scheme you no know, what we give is that you no know, we give in concessional refinance to the cooperatives at 1% rate uh, which is submitted by government of india and then uh, you know uh, th then we will encourage them to have a collectivize actually at the field level what we are doing is that nearby primary cooperatives are coming together and are are setting up shared infrastructure like if one uh, cooperative setting up a go down the other cooperative will have a processing center aimed at uh, the processing the whatever is stored in this go down so that there will be some mutual benef benefit for these two and and then uh, the sixth point which uh, we want is that no we want to crisis proof uh, the the rural areas going ahead so we want to build the core competencies and core capabilities at the at the field level for that to happen we need i think i think within nabard we need lot of analytical capabilities so now we are setting up a data warehouse for uh, for actually aggregating the data in the rural and agri sector and then using that data for uh, for uh, for a lot of use cases which which uh, these uh, rural rural people can use and then uh, we will form that as the base for the uh, digital uh, backbone for the agri value chain because agri value chain is nothing but tracing the cash flows and for that we need to have uh, the analytical capabilities a data warehouse in place so we are embarking upon that also then the uh, one part is that the guarantee so fpos uh, as you know they are the new entities and there will not be any credit history for them so banks will be reluctant to finance here two aspects we have, we have done one is that we have set up our subsidiary uh, there is a napkisan subsidiary which was encouraged to lend more towards fpos to demonstrate to the uh, the financial system that fpos are bankable so if you see the now the number of uh, fpos assisted by any of the institutions our subsidiary which is the napkisan has assisted close to 250 uh, you know fpos whereas the largest of the public sector bank that is state bank has uh, uh, no, uh, has helped only in double digits maybe 30 or 40 so we we uh, have shown uh, to the financial system that fpos are uh, bankable and then we have set up another subsidiary uh, that called nas sandershan to provide credit guarantee to fpos so that also we have set up so that no any uh, fpo accessing finance from any financial institution will be provided a credit guarantee through our subsidiary and uh, to sum up sum up all these things no we need to now skill uh, the people rural people which is very important to be aware of these uh, changes which are happening and they need to be uh, no they need to be equipped for you know uh, demanding those activities rather than see on the supply side we are doing lot of such activities like providing guarantee or infrastructure we are providing collectivization we are doing but to create demand we need to skill those people to equip to you know use these supply so for that skilling mission also we have launched uh, we have a micro entrepreneurship development fund uh, for doing that we are partnering with lot of ngos and also with the rural self employment training institutes at, uh, present in every district to do that so this is what we are trying to do in the in the agri and rural sector going forward fabulous i think it's a, again a comprehensive holistic approach in the agri and rural sector uh on the demand side and on the supply side uh it's uh it's it's i think really impressive and uh once again the um the power and the the influence and and the tremendous good impact from the bard let me switch back to santosh i understand he's been able to reconnect and so we'll catch up with him now um and santosh i don't know at what point we lost you but um i was asking my second question and for you to circle back on that oh he came he disappeared again there. so briefly he was there oh this is why we need better connectivity yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is the issue sitting in mumbai we are facing this issue means no you can think about there you go yeah. there you go Well, Shadi, then I want to continue with you um, and just probe something you mentioned now twice um, in terms of the role of the agricultural value chain um, yeah. and specifically around financial services providers. So the SHGs uh, and federations, the MFIs, the NBFCs, the payments providers, the banks. I mean, it's just such a panoply of financial service providers across the country. 
um, what do you see in terms of how they could get involved? What are the opportunities for them to get involved in the agri value chains? Yeah. So now the, the traditionally, uh, no, we, need, we will be financing such activities in the agriculture on a standalone basis, as I said earlier, like production credit is what we are doing now primarily. If you see, if you uh, see the split up of uh, around 15 trillion uh, rupees, which is being dispersed uh, in, across uh, India in a year, almost 80% will be the short term finance, which is meant for uh, crop production. That is under the Kisan credit card scheme. So we need to now innovate on these schemes. So now Kisan credit card, of course, uh, around uh, 14 crore uh, farmers have been registered for that of which around we have reached around 8 crore farmers. There is a gap, of course, it is there around 6 crore is what we need to now bridge. But we need to innovate also because even uh, the, the, uh, the NPA that is not performing uh, no assets in within the KCC is very high. So that is because of lack of linkages. That is where no, this agri value chain approach will be helping out. And we need to add products to this KCC because now the production once production happens, they need to be stored. For that, warehousing and, uh, and uh, warehousing will be there, and uh, and for that, there need to be a finance, a working capital finance. So already there is a product link to KCC, but that needs to be now re-emphasized. And it need and uh, then one more thing we did was that uh, that uh, we have geotagged all the warehouses in the country. Close to 1.5 lakh warehouses have been now geotagged, and then you know, on a, on a remote basis, we will now uh, know which all warehouses are there, what are their facilities and what is their vacancy position and which is the warehouse nearby. So this, uh, the, the supply is now there. Now the demand need to be created in terms, as I said earlier, need to, you know, farmers need to be aware of these things and then they should store and then process. So for that to happen now, the value chain approach, which uh, we are talking about, uh, so th there should be a digital backbone for that. Physically, yes, the aggregators are coming and then uh, downstream financing, which uh, this, uh, no, which which is now happening. But it has to be now formalized and it has to be ring fenced for uh, risks which are there. So uh, for for that, there should be more of market linkages. Already we are working with NCDEX uh, for uh, for uh, price discovery and also. Um, tying up with the, the with them with the futures and also options uh, derivatives on this uh, on the on the price prices and uh, for so that no there there should be there will be an assured income recently we have seen how the tomato prices uh, crash because of, or rather uh, tomato prices increase because of the supply chain shocks but then had they had they uh, no done the price discovery beforehand this situation should now would, would not have been happened at either at the producer level or at the consumer level. So, so, uh, so we are working on that, uh, those things and added to that, you no, know, we need to create infrastructure uh, for that, uh, for that the, we are promoting state governments to invest uh, you know, the public uh, in, in investments in, in uh, creating rural, rural infrastructures like Godons or access to those infrastructures in terms of road. And then the private infrastructure in terms of uh, the uh, agri infra fund scheme is there meant for that. So the credit can be accessed at lower rates because there is an interest subvention and banks are directed to lend not above 9% for that. And then there will be an assurance from the government in terms of guarantee uh, for such loans. Uh, the credit guarantee is available through the CGTMSE, that is the credit guarantee fund set up in the CDB. So, uh, so we have ring fenced those activities and banks are encouraged to lend. Only thing now is that there need to be a demand for such products at the field level. So uh, the performance under this uh, agri infra fund scheme is not that encouraging so far. But I understand these projects are having are, are long gestation projects where a lot of clearances need to be there because the, the critical infrastructures are getting created and the real infrastructure they need to have land, then the building permits and such other things. It may take time, but uh, there are they are in the different stages of setting up. I'm sure uh, within uh, within a year or a year or a year and a half. Proper infrastructure will be there, and then a uh, the better price realization will be happening to the farmers. Fabulous. I agree. I think tremendous opportunities in agri and uh, the broader supply chain, value chain, uh, finance opportunities in, in a number of sectors. And again, Navarat is helping lay, lay the framework, lay the groundwork um, for the infrastructure and to help connect with the financial service providers. All right. Well, I am delighted that I think Santosh is yes. is back online. <laughs> I can I, say that. 
I'm so happy to see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Sorry, I had some internet issue. Yep. No worries. We were just talking about the need for connectivity across the globe and, and certainly in India. And uh, so there you have it. You've helped demonstrate the case. Um, but I don't know at what point we lost you. Um, and I was asking question two. Um, and it is to really bring in both the public and the private sector. Um, how do you see the needs from, from both sides? Uh, to help strengthen financial service providers so that they in turn can better serve their clients, whether they be households or small businesses. Okay, thanks, Jenny. So I'll just briefly uh, mention on that particular point. Uh, so a very critical element of the economy that urgently needs to function well in order to facilitate India's strong and sustained recovery from the pandemic is the financial system. This is very clear to all of us. And we, uh, I have few areas that I really would want to focus on where this will really help us and it will help India also reach that $5 trillion economy in the future. That's something that we are planning uh, to be. So one is uh, to have to instill a physical discipline in handling all COVID-19 related implication. Uh, we have to strengthen certain reforms. One would be the financial sector stability where RBI's continued focus on risk-based regulation and supervision will be important Uh very, very important to play a very important role. Then there should be reforms in the non-banking finance company sector, NBFC sector. Uh, you know, we should be able to support them uh, so that they, they'll be able to channel more credit uh, to the uh, segment that is, which requires this kind of funding. Uh, there should be deeper market reforms. Uh, there should be role of fintech. Fintech should play a very important role in, you know, ensuring that uh, credit is provided to the required uh, sector. Uh, also moving from moving to a more strategic public sector footprint. Uh, so uh, whatever the government is recently doing, like consolidation of public sector banks and strengthening of corporate governance, these are encouraging steps uh, towards a more strategic public sector footprint. So this is my views on a few of the points uh, that we should focus on in this area. Jennifer. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. I, I think you've identified several key priorities. And I think especially from your perspective at MasterCard, um, uh, really seeing the role of technology, the role of uh, the broader financial infrastructure and payments, but how that can influence across the financial sector. So let me follow up uh, with a, another question for you since we lost you for a while. Um, clearly uh, around the world and definitely in India, we're seeing the usage of digital financial services accelerating massively during this pandemic. And that's obviously driven by lockdowns, restrictions on mobility, um, and a need. So usage has increased. It's something that we've all been anticipating for a number of years, and the pandemic has accelerated the whole process. So what do you see as the priorities for financial service providers, or the broader financial sector, I should say, to really offer more responsible and inclusive digital financial services. Okay. Again, I've got some points that I wanted to share with the group here. So financial mm -hmm. technology has the unique capability to extend financial inclusion to all, and it can really improve the lives of people uh, across the country. Few things that they can do is uh, it can help bring gap in the traditional methods of doing business in the financial services space. I'll elaborate on that later on what we are doing in this space, uh, Jennifer. It can also deliver financial services to the underserved and unserved markets, uh, which can lead to disruption in uh, across industry. The other thing for financial technology to be, you know, uh, uh, be successful in the last mile, uh, it is very important to drive acceptance. It is very important to drive adoption. Uh, and that can be made possible only if technology uh, is affordable and accessible. Uh, technology clearly demonstrates the benefit it will bring to the lives and of people and to the businesses. And technology should be convenient to adopt and cause minimal disruption. And technology should be dependable and trustworthy. So these are some of the thoughts that I had on technology. And also to expand the reach of financial services, fintechs must focus on building trust. And that can only happen by doing a lot of training, education uh, to the small businesses because they need to be comfortable to use technology. All these years, they have not been using technology. And, you know, they've been using, like Mr. Vedanathan mentioned, it was all cash transactions. How do they move to the digital space? So a lot of uh, training is required. A lot of handholding is required. Uh, 
it is important to build the trust uh, and also the fintech should be able to offer flexible credit to the target segments to the SMS, smes and uh, these are two areas that i feel are very important uh, so that technology is adopted by the segment that actually requires them in this this time Excellent. that's much Excellent. I think this need for flexibility and differentiated responses is, is truly important across all financial services and, and geographies. So thank you, Santosh. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, some of the questions from the audience that I'm seeing come in. And a big thank you uh, to those of you who are sharing questions for our, our panelists. Um, the, we have three that have come in so far. Um, so let me uh, read out the first, and then we'll see if either of you would like to tackle that one. Um, and it, it relates to uh, the first part of our panel. Um, the question is, uh, how do you see the effectiveness of the government's various packages and strategies for helping reboot the, the informal sector, improve competitiveness of local markets, and build their resilience and preparedness to cope with shocks and emergencies? Is there more that could be done? So clearly acknowledging what's what's already been done, which is significant. How do you see see that and what else could be done in addition? Yeah, so can I take that? Please. Yeah. Shaji, yeah. So, so uh, the government has clearly done a lot of efforts uh, to encourage not only their own investments to happen and uh, turn around uh, the sector, but also partnered with uh, financial institutions as well as with the private sector. So now coming to the financial sector, because whatever packages they have announced was mainly through the financial sector, like uh, you know, emergency credit lines, so that you no know, financial uh, the banks are encouraged to lend. Uh, government, the sovereign has taken the risk, whatever is happen whatever may happen at the later stage. So uh, the, the infrastructure development, which, which was intended, yes, because it is a you know, long-term process, Clearly, there are turnarounds, but then perceptible changes will happen in the due course because there are a lot of things which are work in progress. Uh, now, the banks are now encouraged to lend. That is, there is no uh, 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 single uh, no, no, different opinion about that. Though, but then if you see the incremental credit uh, deposit ratio, the ratio has come down not because of lack of availability of credit, but because of the people parking a lot of funds to the bank whose deposits are growing at double digits. Whereas the, uh, the credit demand, though muted, it is there. So now there need to be a sustained effort to improve the credit. For that to happen, the fiscal, the monetary policies are now supportive, but fiscal policies are now uh, working for, for that to happen. So the credit absorption capacity at, of the people need to be improved and people should be encouraged. The private sector should be encouraged to invest. And there, there should not be any any fear that no any any other in, impact will be there on the lockdown. That's why when the second uh, look, uh, the second wave came, uh, the country didn't go for a lockdown to assure that no we will not uh, stop the uh, the economic activities of the people. But then we'll try to improve the vaccination. We'll try to improve the health infrastructure. And precisely for that, you no know, RBI has announced a separate window for uh, health related infrastructure creation and uh, you know uh, some uh, some subsidized financing were were given so uh, all these things should uh, should now uh, you know uh, result in uh, improved activity as i said uh, now the supply is there the now the demand need to be there so it has to be a cycle where you no know, money should be there in the hands of the people for that to happen this uh, rural employment generation program and uh, also the food security programs which uh, government is uh, augmenting these will be giving a lot of money, surplus money at the hands of the people. Otherwise, this money will be spent on uh, food and such other activities. So the demand will be there and this will encourage more uh, you know, investments. So that means the manufacturing activity has to improve. The so cycle has to now keep kicking and it will kick in soon. Great. Jennifer, I also want to add one point to various, uh, yeah, yeah. various uh, support that the government has provided. One I would like to highlight is for the street vendors. Last year, they uh, announced a PM Swanidhi program where the street vendors would be given 10,000 rupees uh, loan and uh, the kind of support the government was giving the private sector also came in to play. The idea was because of lockdown, these people were really impacted. There was nobody going out and doing uh, any purchases with them. Uh, nobody wanted to do cash transactions. So governments encouraged them to get into the digital ecosystem so that they could accept QR transactions. And, you know, they had 
uh, they could get into the di digital space so these are this gives confidence to the ecosystem this gives gives confidence to the people the uh, the you know uh, the poor people the uh, smes uh, the street vendors and it also gives confidence to the lenders that yes if government is backing such programs we should also participate and ensure that we uh, make the livelihoods better for these people so terrific and i think building confidence in the systems and in the That's services right. is is really a key piece of all of this uh, so that that usage will continue to grow. Um, okay, so a second question that's coming in now from the audience, um, and Shaji, it's directed towards you. Um, it's asking from Nabard's perspective. Um, while Nabard's FPO focus in recent times is well placed, is Nabard working towards a window for creating some role model FPOs? with all ecosystem agents actively participating. Yeah, so here, you know, in the FPO space, NABARD is doing uh, multifarious activities. One is, of course, uh, you know, uh, they are uh, you know, encouraging people, you know, farmers to come together to form FPOs. Already around 4,000 FPOs have been formed and another 5,000 is on the annual. So now and another thing what we have done is that you know, we have created a model uh, for, uh, for the banks to follow so that you no, know, they can lend. How they rate the FPOs? How what all things they should see while lending to FPOs? So it is like a toolkit to the banks. So what we have done is that based on our experience during the last say five or six years in FPO formation, what uh, we have developed a toolkit and shared with the Reserve Bank of India. And Reserve Bank of India in turn has circulated to all banks so that you no, know, uh, when, when their FPO uh, you no know, reaches the brand bank branch for any activity. There should be no doubt about uh, the assessment. There, there are clear guidelines for that. That is one. Second, uh, the third part was that uh, we, uh, as I said earlier, we encouraged banks to lend, and then we have shown that FPOs are, uh, you know, creditworthy people. For so, so that for that to happen, our own subsidiary, as I said earlier, around 250 uh, FPOs have been financed. So banks are now looking at our model to uh, to to finance them. And then we are encouraging uh, no capacity building for FPOs in terms of uh, training for the CEOs and the training for the uh, board of directors of these FPOs because most of these FPOs are registered as companies. So we are uh, uh, no, actively partnering with institutions to handhold them. And then uh, we are now uh, creating you know, the infrastructure, the processing infrastructure for that, as I said earlier, the multi-service centers, which we are trying to build through the cooperative model here. So that will help FPOs uh, to to, uh, to use those facilities uh, for uh, for their uh, you know, uh, income generating activities and then the guarantee part the guarantee part uh, is there uh, to encourage banks to lend because even if some business loss is there the, their uh, you know, whatever exposure to FPOs will be protected in terms of guarantee that also we are working on excellent again um, a multi-pronged approach from Nabard uh, really building out the various pillars uh, in a very holistic manner Okay, so the third question that's coming from the audience, um, and I'll open it up for either of you or both of you if you'd like to respond, is um, we've referred a few times now in the conversation uh, this morning to uh, given a, of a, a differentiated response. So the question is, given this principle of differentiated response, is there a focus on informal spaces in urban areas and informal sectors more broadly, especially those in manufacturing sectors uh, for productive loans or productive usage, let's call it, of financial services. It could be payments, it could be value chain finance, et cetera. So, so in the urban space, uh, you know, informal sector, the, the earlier one scheme was mentioned here, that the Swanandhi scheme, that is aimed at you no, uh, no giving formal finance, that is, in institutions, banks should give finance to the street vendors. That the PM Swanandhi scheme, which is you uh, know some sort of an inform formalization of the informal sector. But at the at the at the manufacturing level, uh, of course, the SMEs. So now uh, now what we see is that you now the credit is there, but then whether adequate credit is there and the credit which we have uh, uh, we have given through the financial inclusion approaches, the accounts were opened and credit uh, was also the second pillar of that. But there need to be a lot of things to be done. So first cycle of credit, which we have given, is largely utilized for their consumption needs. Now they should graduate into some micro enterprises. 
But again, one problem will be there. No, the preponderance of micro enterprises will be self defeating because the quality issues, whatever the production they are uh, uh, having, may not have the sufficient quality, or they may compete with an existing micro enterprises which is successful. With, uh, but what with their substandard product, they will come up and uh, destroy whatever the profits are available for the existing micro enterprises. So we need to now, uh, you know, aggregate this micro enterprises. That is what we are trying to do. Uh, the collectivization of micro enterprises at the urban and the rural level. Uh, that need to be there so that they will be complementary rather than competing with each other or helping them to graduate to small enterprises with the with the larger uh, you know uh, target audience or larger sales and such other things. Some sort of uh, you know more investments need to be given. So there we need to augment activities. It's a part of financial inclusion, but then it is the next stage of financial inclusion. Uh, the, the credit stage uh, which has to be augmented. Still, a lot of formalization need to be there. For uh, in the in the urban and the rural sector in terms of uh, uh, no, uh, the credit delivery, so that activity also we need to do. A lot of job is to be done in the in the both in the urban and the rural sector. Yeah, fully agreed. A, a lot of work yet ahead. Santosh, would you like to come in on this question? Yeah, Jennifer, I'll take this question also, and I just wanted to touch upon certain some work that we are doing on the MSME side, on the Kirana side also, because I missed because of the internet issue. So on the Kirana side, I'll just uh, highlight that um, we have been seeing that there is a lot of challenges these small Kirana stores face today because they are small and uh, banks or acquiring partners do not want to give them a post terminal. We all have a vision that they should get digitized, they should be in the digital ecosystem, but they are so small that it is it doesn't make sense for a bank to provide a post terminal for them to ex start accepting cards. And also they have other challenges like they don't have any kind of recourse, they don't have collateral, they don't have any assets where a lender is comfortable lending them uh, anything, you know, to grow their business. So what we are trying, we are working a model which we had launched in Africa sometime back with the Unilever group called Jasa Duka, where uh, based on the sales uh, data provided by the FMCG company, which we provide to the lending institute uh, that acts as a surrogate and based on that a credit is provided to these uh, small Kirana stores. So that's something that we are working on in India. We are working with a lot of partners here with the lending partners and FMCG companies to ensure that uh, these Kirana stores get credit uh, and that becomes a formal kind of lending that they get from these lending institutes. Uh, the second thing is we are also working for them to get into the digital acceptance space uh, to give them a a uh, more economic version of a post terminal. So we call some, we call it a soft post where, you know, the uh, merchant can download a software on a smartphone and he can start accepting cards. He doesn't have to have a post terminal. He can start accepting uh, any, any network card. He can start accepting QR and, you know, that way he gets into the digital ecosystem. He has a history of transactions that he's doing that helps him speak to the lender going forward and, ensuring that he gets good credit and he can grow his business. So those are things that we're doing in this space to ensure that uh, these marginalized uh, Kirana stores are also in the digital ecosystem and they get a credit. Yeah. Terrific. I think that's a really good example of the power of payments and bringing the Kirana stores and other small businesses uh, into the broader the uh, economy. Yeah. And, and into the broader financial system and, and broader economy. Terrific. That's a great example. Um, Shaji, we have one last question from the audience, um, and it's again towards Nabard's uh, work with FPOs. Um, the question is, we have, we have more than 10,000 FPOs across the country. Do we have data on how many of them are active? Um, the FPOs that have received loans from banks seem to be relatively few, and your comments. Yeah. So uh, the 10,000 figure which uh, the, the, the person has asked, it is the target, the new FPOs which government is targeting at. Right now, we have close to around 6,000 FPOs have, which have been there, of which uh, close to 4,500 is by Nabar. So now, uh, to coming to the credit linkage of these FPOs, yes, uh, the, questioner, uh, the, the question is correct in uh, telling that no, the credit linkages are less. As I said, uh, banks are were uh, initially reluctant because these are all the new areas and they don't have a credit, the FPOs don't have a credit history and they are new entities uh, just uh, registered. 
So what, that is why precisely government wants to give confidence to the lenders to lend to FPOs. There, this guarantee product, the credit guarantee, which I mentioned earlier, will now entice uh, this, uh, you know, uh, this lenders because once uh, the credit guarantee is given, it is a sovereign guarantee. So risk weight for such loans also will be less. They need to, uh, you know, provide only lesser capital for such loans. That will lead to, uh, you know, a lesser uh, cost for the such. Uh, 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 such loans and uh, also the credit risk is now ring fence because uh, when, when some untoward incident happened and the loan is not getting repaid, banks are saved through the guarantee. So now we need to uh, you know, increase the credit linkages of APOs. There is no doubt about that. Uh, for that to happen, we are working closely with the banks. That is where that is where I told about the toolkit which we have developed for uh, for the banks to use to follow the procedure and give the loans once they follow the procedure and give the loans this will be automatically covered under the credit guarantee so banks need not worry about uh, the recovery aspects of that so uh, yes right now the linkages are less but going forward we are going to see a lot of turnaround in this uh, credit linkage as well thank you very much okay well it's um I'm going to try and give a few threads uh, as uh, under guise of, of some type of summary here, but I think we've had an incredibly rich discussion. So this will be my best effort. Uh, please bear with me here. Um, what I'm hearing from both gentlemen and from our opening speaker, uh, Mr. Vaidyanathan, is that it really feels like you believe, and I sincerely hope this is true, that India is turning the corner on the path of recovery. And we're coming back to whatever is going to be the next new normal uh, in our economies around the world. Um, you've both given a number of examples of the tremendous public sector response and the private sector resilience and effort uh, during um, this pandemic and, and the response uh, that we've all been living through. In terms of some of the needs going forward or the remaining challenges, uh, we've talked about um, and some of the catchwords that I've heard both gentlemen use is democratizing digital financial services. Clearly COVID has accelerated usage and the transition towards digital financial services. Um, and how can we further encourage uptake confidence in the system um, and uh, really building on uh, the payments infrastructure that is remarkable. I mean, seriously, what NPCI and RBI and the private sector have done across payments in India is a remarkable story. But we also need to continue building through rural connectivity, and it's sometimes urban connectivity, as, as Santosh has helped us prove today, um, but also other opportunities that we're seeing is the second point around building on market linkages, uh, really linking small businesses, whether the Karana shops or other businesses across various economic sectors, uh, linking them into the payments infrastructure and being a gateway into broader financial services and economic growth. Um, we can use supply chain finance, trade, there are a number of different angles to go about this, but to really help bring in financial services along agri and other value chains and bringing in those small businesses. A third area is to really help stimulate job recovery and investments. Um, this is clearly a role uh, for public and private sector uh, and the, in the public sector side, certainly fiscal and monetary policy. Um, and a fourth area that we've talked about is differentiated responses for financial services, uh, greater segmentation, greater nuance in terms of designing and offering financial services, um, whether for a, a range of households and, and uh, individual clients, uh, as well as a range of business size um, across India's vast and differing geographies, again, south to north and west to east. Um, and the last point I'd like to mention, again, about building confidence and usage in the system is really customer protection, customer recourse, and adequate customer privacy measures so that people really have that confidence uh, to use and um, benefit from and expand uh, their household assets, their business assets, and wealth and increase their own household and business resilience. So what I hear from the panel, uh, and I certainly share a tremendous optimism for the future, 
uh, for inclusive, sustainable economic growth across India. And I would like to offer my, my deep appreciation for your perspectives, both Shaji and Santosh. I think you both bring a uh, tremendous experience and perspective uh, to these questions that we've just been addressing. So I'd like to thank everyone for uh, participating. Um, I think uh, with the, the opening uh, session that we've just heard um, and then our second session, I, I hope we've uh, helped get the summit off to a good start and I really wish everyone well for these next two days. And I would like to give a special appreciation to Vipin and Priyamvada and the full access team. Uh, I've been participating in these summits for a number of years and you've been organizing them even longer than I've been participating, which is since 2009. Uh, and you do a tremendous job organizing this absolutely critical summit for our sector, financial services. So thank you. And I'd like to turn it back to uh, Priyamvada for some announcements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And you're right. This is actually the 18th year uh, of uh, the Inclusive Finance India Summit. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you. Thank you, panelists, so much for this very important discussion. And special mention to, of course, Jennifer for such depth moderation. We had some challenges with technology and, uh, you know, panelists dropping off. But thank you so much for this. Uh, and I think this was a very important uh, discussion for uh, to set the overall context uh, for the summit, which is building financial resilience strategies for yeah, revival yeah, yeah. which yeah, is this year's uh, you know uh, overall theme for the summit um so thank you thank you everyone thank you audiences for joining in we had uh, 287 people logged in uh, for this particular session um so with that uh, we move on to our next uh, sessions which uh, we break away into the thematic tracks so we have hall a where we will be host hosting, uh, bolstering the pace of the pyramid, yeah, yeah. building better with microfinance. Uh, so Hall B will be hosting, building community uh, capabilities, uh, new economy aids for financial inclusion. And Hall C will have the track on catalyzing capital, impact investment and financial inclusion. I request the audiences to please log in to the tracks of your interest and hope you find the sessions insightful and uh, important for you. Thank you so much.